Coming up on This Week in Linux, we're going to check out some app news for OBS, Quad Libet, and more. We also have some distro news to talk about for OpenSUSE, Debian, Dev1, and Lubuntu. Then we're going to talk about some Linux gaming and Linux security news. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and you're watching This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux good news. We've got a lot to talk about this week, so let's just jump into it. A new version of Quad Libet has been released, version 3.9.0. If you're not familiar, Quad Libet is a music player, and one of the, the things to talk about in this release is actually a new feature for the checkbox that stops the queue after it is empty, which is really cool because previously it would continue whether you wanted it to or not. So now I like the fact that you can add a feature that allows you to stop it if you want to. You can also change the resizing of the panes in the pane browser, which is very nice. And another note is that Python 3.4 is now a requirement for Quad Libet. So if you're using or wanting to use Quad Libet, you need to make sure that you have that version of Python or newer version. Quad Libet is a nice music player, but if you're wanting to create your own music, there's Ardor. And recently Ardor released version 5.9 with a lot of cool features, so if making music is your thing, be sure to check it out. Firefox has a new design called Photon coming out. We talked about this in the previous episode, but there, at the time there wasn't a Linux preview for it. And this is a website that Mozilla set up so that you can actually demo what it's going to look like. And you can find that in the video description if you're interested in looking at it yourself. But essentially this is what it will look like. And there's also like a compact mode and you can, you know, display the sidebar, things like that. But it's got also a dark mode, a light mode, and some custom potentials like what, with the personas and stuff like that. Um, and then also you can resize it so that the uh, bar is, is all combined into one. So that's pretty cool. But um, I'm not really sure how I feel about it because some parts of it are a little weird to me and some aren't. Like this, these gaps right here, this gap and this gap, they just seem like a, a waste of space. I don't know, everything else I have, I have no problem with, but that, I don't know, that bothers me for some reason. Maybe I'm weird. I don't know. What do you think? Not the weird part. What do you think about the photon design of Firefox? Thunderbird has a new home, sort of. The Thunderbird email client was previously a part of the Mozilla Corporation and is no longer going to be using that infrastructure. Instead, they're going to be a part of the Mozilla Foundation, where the legal and fiscal home of the Thunderbird project will be. The thing I find most interesting about this news is that Thunderbird will remain a Gecko-based application for the midterm, but will eventually adopt a new platform so that Gecko will no longer be utilized. They haven't described what that might be yet, but I am very interested to find out because I do think that Thunderbird is a little bit sluggish due to the Gecko engine. So I'm hopeful. A new version of OBS Studio is out, and with it comes a really awesome feature. Now, if you look at the change log, you'll see a lot of hot fixes and a lot of improvements, and overall just general changes that improve the system as a whole, which are significantly important. Like a lot of these are very good, and a lot of these are pretty cool, like the Control-E shortcut to edit transforms. But at the very bottom is the mention of adding the Auto Scene Switcher to Linux. The Auto Scene Switcher is so cool. What it does is essentially, you can set up different scenes in OBS and depending on what applications you are actively using, the scenes will follow with you and just switch automatically so you don't actually have to go back to OBS to change anything. That is awesome. WPS Office for Linux is on a halt. WPS Office claims to be bringing the world's best office experience to Linux. Last release was 2016 in June. So Angry Penguin on Twitter asked, are you still working on WPS Office for Linux, or is it abandoned? And their reply was, it's on a halt. Needs community builds. Which is, you know, typically not that big of a deal. Unfortunately, WPS Office is proprietary, and therefore not possible to do community builds. 
Christopher Price, replied with, are you planning on open sourcing the Linux code to make community builds possible? Yes, unfortunately right now, we're mostly focused on mobile, but Linux is planned for end of year. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Are you talking about releasing a new version by the end of the year or releasing the source code by the end of the year? Because if it's just the source code, you could pretty much do that anytime you want. And it's been a year since your last release. So you've had a year and potentially a year and a half if you wait until the end of this year to release the source code. So what's holding you up in that situation? I don't know. Doesn't sound very promising. So let's look at some alternatives to WPS Office. Here are two alternatives that I would suggest you take a look at. LibreOffice and OnlyOffice. LibreOffice is the successor to OpenOffice, which is essentially dead, but it's the biggest name in open source software for, open, for Office suites, and it's a pretty big name in just open source software in general. OnlyOffice is another open source software suite for uh, Office and productivity, and you should definitely take a look at that if you're interested in having an alternative to an Office suite. Both of them look pretty good, especially with the new release for LibreOffice UI. Uh, but the, the interface for OnlyOffice is also quite good. So take a look at both of those. The Enlightenment team has announced release of 0.21.8 of Enlightenment, which has a lot of bug fixes like display fixes and some Wayland specific changes. If you want to see the full change log, you can do so by checking out the link in the video description. Be sure to let me know what you think of the new features of Enlightenment. I know this is a little premature, but KDE Plasma 5.10 will be released on May 30th, which is a Tuesday, and it's going to have a lot of new features, which you can find out below in the video description. I have a link to the Plasma 5.9.95 beta announcement that details a lot of the new features. I will also do a more in-depth description of the things that are being done in the new version next week. But for now, if you want to take a look at it, just check the video description. The Peppermint team just announced today the release of Peppermint 8, which is an LXDE-based distro built on top of Ubuntu 1604. If you've never tried Peppermint, then I suggest you give it a spin, even if just to try out their site-specific browser framework called ICE. It's a really cool concept that may be enough by itself to use Peppermint. I just realized I made a cool pun accidentally about a tool named ICE. Alright, moving on. From Peppermint, let's transition to another LXDE-based distro with Lubuntu, but in a twist, Lubuntu has announced that LXQT will be available in the 17.10 release. Daily builds to try out LXQT are available right now, but they're in the pre-alpha stage, so don't expect to use them in production. There isn't any confirmation at this time whether or not LXQT will replace LXDE entirely in 17.10, or both desktop environments will be available to users. I suspect that it is likely to be a transition phase during the release, so my guess is both LXDE and LXQT will be available for the 17.10 release of Lubuntu. The LXQT is a very promising DE, and I look forward to trying it out in Lubuntu when they release Alpha Stage in about a month. The 2017 OpenSUSE conference has just recently ended, and thankfully OpenSUSE has uploaded videos for all the talks to their YouTube channel. So definitely check them out. You can find a link to the 2017 conference playlist in the video description below. This week, the first 1.0 stable release of Dev1 was announced. Dev1 was initially announced in November of 2014 as a response to the decision Debian made to use Systemd as their init system. This is news that might be good for the anti-Systemd crowd, but it also could be bittersweet for announcement for them. Yes. Dev1 1.0 Jesse LTS is now available for use, but pretty much every piece of software is very old, including the desktop environment they are shipping with. Dev1 comes with XFCE 4.10 by default, which was released five years ago. It also comes with Linux kernel version 3.16.43. You may be thinking, well, that's because Dev1 is based on Debian, and Debian has the same versions of the software. Speaking of Debian, Debian 9 has been announced that it will be coming on June 17th, so less than a month. 
And if you're interested, be sure to find out where the, the nearest release party will be to you, which you can find a link to the release party wiki page in the video description below. Wine has published a couple notable releases recently with version 2.8 and 2.9. The most notable aspect of the 2.8 release is the support for Direct3D command stream to run asynchronously. And for the Wine 2.9 is the new support for tessellation shaders in Direct3D. The 2.8 release brings improvements to some big titles like Star Wars The Old Republic and StarCraft. Wine 2.9 brings improved support for The Witcher 3, Need for Speed, The Run, and League of Legends, as well as many more. Feral Interactive released a couple real-time strategy games this week for Linux with Total War Shogun 2 and Total War Shogun 2 Fall of the Samurai. If you're an RTS fan, check out these games and also make note on your calendar for June 8th because that's the Linux release date for Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War 3. Feral Interactive announced on their Twitter that we'll be getting a Linux release on June 8th and considering the original Windows release was on April 27, 2017, I am happy to see such a short time period from the re original release to the Linux port. This is the kind of development speed I like to see. Well, first day releases would be absolutely ideal, but I'm used to waiting years for games at this point, so only having to wait a month is a very welcome improvement. If that wasn't enough already, Feral announced on their Twitter that Dawn of War 3 will have support for the Vulcan Graphics API, so that's pretty cool. Feral Interactive is a video game publisher that specializes in porting games. Feral started releasing Linux ports in 2014, and I just wanted to mention the company behind these ports because I'm very much appreciative for what they're doing. Not only has Feral brought us these RTS games, but also many others like Hitman, Tomb Raider, Mad Max, Dirt Rally, and Grid Autosport. So thanks Feral, and keep it up. Humble Bundle has two great bundles out at the moment. Unfortunately, the indie bundle is about to end, so hopefully you see this episode before that happens. The Humble Indie Bundle has a lot of interesting indie games, all of which work on Linux. So if you've wanted to play Goat Simulator, then here's your chance to get a nice discount on it. I'd also suggest checking out the bundle for the Neon Drive game because this game looks pretty sweet. The Humble Game On Bundle has a total of 8 games, 6 of which support Linux. Grim Fandango, Day of the Tentacle, and The Stanley Parable are games I'm looking forward to in this bundle, but Borderlands the Pre-Sequel is by itself enough to get it in my opinion. Borderlands the Pre-Sequel is the follow-up game to Borderlands 2, which was freaking awesome. And it's $40 on Steam right now, but you can get it in the Game On bundle for just $10. If you haven't played Borderlands 2 yet, the Pre-Sequel is a sequel to Borderlands 1, but a prequel to Borderlands 2, so in terms of the story, it might even work to play the Pre-Sequel first. I can't promise that because I had played Borderlands 2 before the Pre-Sequel came out, but it might. Oh, and if you haven't played Borderlands 1, don't worry. The story was very minimal in the first game, and it didn't pick up until Borderlands 2, so you can pretty much just skip it. Checkpoint Research has revealed this week a new attack vector via media player subtitles. By creating malicious subtitle files that could be downloaded by media players, an attacker can take complete control over any type of device that contains the vulnerabilities. Checkpoint estimated that there are approximately 200 million video players or streamers that could be vulnerable at the time of the announcement. This is not necessarily specifically related to Linux, but it is uh, an important thing to talk about. But thanks to the nature of open source, VLC and Kodi, for example, have already released updates to fix the issue. Checkpoint contacted VLC and Kodi teams to inform them of the issue prior to the announcement. VLC and Kodi have both created a fix for this issue and have released updates for their users, so if you haven't updated your media players in a while, be sure to do that today. You've probably heard of the WannaCry exploit that spread around the world recently infecting thousands and thousands of window machines via SMB security issues. Well, this week we found out about a vulnerability that was in Samba due to SMB security issues, though it's not directly related to the WannaCry exploit. Thankfully though, Samba is an open source project, so we already have a patch and most distros have already pushed out updates for the fix. Ubuntu, for example, has released multiple updates for, to fix all supported versions of the distro. This Samba vulnerability has brought on some criticisms from anti-Linux people about how we aren't protected from these kinds of issues, so we shouldn't brag about Linux's security prowess. I just wanted to take a moment at the end of the video to talk about this claim because it's silly misinformation that those people are just spreading. Linux is not invulnerable to everything, but no one should really claim that anyway. 
But in this case, most Linux systems are completely invulnerable to the WannaCry exploit. And the reason for that is quite simple. WannaCry uses SMB to accomplish this exploit. And while yes, Samba provides SMB support to Linux users, none of the big mainstream distros provide Samba by default. This means that default Linux users are not affected because the tool that potentially could be used isn't even installed. Now in regards to the Samba specific issue, you should absolutely install the updates because having an up-to-date system is very important for security, but there are many cases where the vulnerability might not affect you. If you only use Samba as a client and not a server, if you have Samba shares configured for read-only, or if you set the NT pipe support option to no, all of these scenarios would result in the vulnerability not being exploitable. So the attack vector in this case is pretty narrow. So while Linux systems aren't 100% invulnerable to SMB issues, it's possible that 99.9% .9 of them are. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this channel, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.